This is Squawk. I'm Bruce Whitfield. We've got Sasha Narishkin from Vest Act and Nick Norman Smith from Lentis Asset Managers with us this evening to take us through all the big stories here on Squawk. Coming up tonight, the Rand loses its downward momentum, briefly anyway, as striking work miners lower their wage expectations. Microsoft buys a potential Steve Ballmer replacement as it snaps up Nokia's handset division for 70 billion Rand. Should Kevin Hedewick be worried as Grand Parade unveils its big Burger King plans, Spurs not doing too badly either. The market not buying Adrian Gore's Discovery UK story, Coronation puts on its tackies and takes a stake in the whole sport and it races to 25% stake. Why well, footballers matter more than chief executives. That's all coming up on this evening's edition of Squawk. Thanks for joining us on Squawk. You're watching CNBC Africa. First in business worldwide, Nick Norman Smith from Lentis Asset Managers and Sasha Narishkin from Best Act join us uh, this evening. Markets are a little bit lackadaisical, a little bit sideways, a little bit flopsy, mopsy, cottontailish, wouldn't you say, Sasha? Mm, the Syria hangover, or you know, the pending hangover. Um, Syria, Egypt, Iraq, Afghanistan hangover. And and yeah. and. But yet, motor vehicle sales in the U.S. are the highest since October 2007. The Fed beige book seems to indicate things are going a little bit better. I think the angst over taper, probably, or the Fed's tapering, will be revealed, I think, two weeks yesterday. Mm. So that's probably the key story in the very, very short term, but where to next for Mark? Yeah, about 42,500 or thereabouts. So it, it, are you comfortable at current levels? You guys are a little bit bearish on, on high valuations in the market, don't you think? Yeah, well, it depends what you look at because it is a very, very, uh, you know, two, two sets really. So um, we've, we've seen a big comeback in the, in the resource sector in the last uh, month or so. Um, particularly the platinum miners and um, th and those have rallied up quite nicely. So we we like them and and we see some see some value there. Whereas the the industrial stocks and a lot of the retailers, even though some of them have been sold quite heavily, look quite expensive. So to look at the market on a whole, it's it, it doesn't look ridiculously overvalued. But then you you know you dig down into it and there's some in our view, horrendously overvalued companies and, and pretty cheap companies. You like the platinum shares, nobody seems to like the gold mining shares very much. Does the outcome of wage negotiations in the gold mining sector, high or low, make the slightest bit of difference to a view on the gold mining sector? Or is it just doomed? Look, I think if, if you're going to be investing in these sort of labor intensive companies, you, you need to understand that you, you know, wage, wages in South Africa are generally going to go up and it's probably going to be bad news and you need to factor that into your valuation. So I don't think it's going to have a binary effect, but uh, look, the the news in the gold sector is poor and, and we're certainly not uh, particularly positive on it. You know, platinum has specifics that, that make it attractive, which the golds don't. So, yeah, you know, increasing costs and, and that's just not good for gold miners who have no pricing power. I saw a great quote on Bloomberg just before the strike was declared when? earlier this week when they were talking about the, there was an analyst talking on the Bloomberg wire service about, uh, <laughs> about, the, about the fact that this is the slowest train crash in history yes. that is evolving. This is yes. a mining industry that is, you've got workers in the mining industry, they know their careers are, are short term, they know their time at work is limited. They're going to screw the squeeze out in many possible gains as they possibly can to make as much money in the short term as possible because even they know that this is not even a sunset industry it's like a an eclipse industry yeah, and you actually saw that via david shapiro tweeted that mm. i think didn't you hey, no i didn't i heard it from somewhere else oh, from somewhere else okay but we he, miss david gosh i miss david today i like nick i miss david yeah we yeah, all carry miss on. david so <laughs> much um he, you know in fact many people have been calling it a sunset industry for the last decade and the truth is that you know production you know, where are we now in the world? We're sixth place. Sixth or seventh, yeah. You know, in 1981 or 1982, we produced two thirds of the stuff globally. So mm. that's in part other people having added extra production, but we're not, you know, anywhere near number one. And the, the, the problem is, is obviously all the good stuff's gone. So, you know, whereas I can buy an energy price that the marginal cost of production for the next barrel should make the oil price higher, Essentially, the gold miners in South Africa are price takers yeah. and not price makers. Have you ever had a whopper? 
Uh, the I don't eat um, red meat, Bruce. So the short answer is no. Have you ever had a Whopper? I have. The burgers are right, but the the chips taste like soap, unfortunately. So I really you don't like Burger soap, King Nick? chips. <laughs> well, no, well, we well, I had one bite and never again. <laughs> have, have, you, have you sampled Burger King's wares in Cape Town? Because I, they've got three outlets. I haven't. Now. I hear there's okay. uh, still queues going on. So they, they've still got queues in Cape Town. And Grand Parade Investments, bless them, they've got things that make considerably more money than Burger King is likely to make in the next 10 years. Everyone's just only we only care about Burger King. Yeah, and I mean, that's, I mean, that, that, I guess, you know, the media's got to sell the right story, but uh, it's, it's a very small amount, you know. Grand Parade is, is all Sun International's best assets, effectively. Um, mm. Yes, uh, you know, they're moving into into some more casino-related businesses and limited power machines, which, which have got some nice growth potential. And they're manufacturing and looking to export these machines, which they're making in Atlantis and Cape Town. Yeah, so, uh, it, you know, at least that's in the same kind of area, and it is, you know, it's casinos and... And, and that's what they know. Um, but obviously, they were much more of a passive business, which have turned into a much more active business. So with that comes some risks. But uh, yeah, the Burger King, it's an exciting story, but it's, you know, it's a competitive, very competitive retail environment out there. So it, I don't think it's going to Yeah, it's overtake. nice hype. I mean, they did 20 million round turnover in the first six months. They did exceptionally well on Burger King with queues around the block, one outlet um, in the middle of town in a building they own, then Tiger Valley Shopping Center and at Cavendish. They've got another two being built in the Western Cape as we speak. And by this time next year, they tell me they're going to have 30 of these outlets. Each Cape, one of... Cape uh, Town? Uh, um, yeah. Come <laughs> it's, on. It's Bruce. apparently part of the country. Um, and here we've got a situation where they are growing a competitor to Kevin Hedwig, albeit slowly. Should he be losing an ounce of sleep? Over I'm this? so glad you said this because I saw a picture of the new steers in London mm. equally had people lining up outside missing their homegrown steers burger. So... Maybe there's a big novelty impact yeah. here. Um, I still, you know, I think the the gold standard in terms of fast food is still being set by McDonald's um, and Yum globally. You know, the likes of Wendy and Burger King in a US context, anyhow, they've been you know, literally cornered out of the market by McDonald's, 34,000 yeah. outlets globally, and the plan is still to have one in every neighborhood. And I'm well aware that there are more than 34,000 neighborhoods Absolutely. globally. So, great franchise model. Um, the stock price of McDonald's, unfortunately, has come under pressure. And right. I think maybe, maybe, and maybe Nick can add some insight here into the dividend players becoming a little bit tired as the growth story kind of slows. That's an interesting one. Give us some, give us some yeah, thoughts. Look, you know, people, people are saying, with rates so low, people are saying, look, I'll take any dividend. And, and suddenly a 2.5%, 3% dividend looks fantastic when, uh, you know, and when, you're paying, when you're paying a massive, so You're paying low. a massive multiple to get that 3% yeah, dividend. Exactly. You're taking and, a lot of risk to get the this, dividend. And this yeah. is the problem that people look at. They, say, they, they forget this is equity risk. So it's all very well and good looking at the dividend. But if the underlying earnings and the stock price is too high, a 3% dividend, if you've got a 20% capital depreciation, it really hurts you. So a dividend should be an afterthought. Yes, you should have a business that's attractively valued and has got some strong sustainable earnings. If, that's, if that valuation is attractive, and by the way, they're spitting out a decent dividend, well, well, then great. So you look at you know the, companies. The best example of that locally, there was African Bank, wasn't it? Because there was African Bank trading at uh, 40 rand a share. It was trading on a dividend yield of 7%. And people were buying it for the dividend yield. They were thinking this was Christmas come early. But um, you, need, you need to look at those underlying earnings. And those are peak earnings on the back of the best yeah. period for unsecured lending in the history that this country's ever seen. And so you've got to say, is, is that sustainable? And that lesson is absolutely crucial We're, to all of us. On exactly. So, so you need to always look at what is a normalized through the cycle amount of money that this business can make. And if it can make that sustainably and it's paying out a decent chunk, then you can probably bank on that dividend. Otherwise, be wary. I, mean, I keep getting messages from people saying, please, why don't you talk about exchange-traded funds? This is a great opportunity to talk about the Satrix Divi Plus exchange-traded mm. fund. If mm. you're in Satrix Divi Plus, is it time to bail? on Satrix Divi Plus, because those are historically the top 20, I think, best dividend payers over the last year are included in that particular index. And if we're seeing the end of the boom in, in dividend-related in investments coming, well, then perhaps it's time to exit that. 
maybe the people creating the product must look at the historical dividends and maybe go for the more high quality um, kind of lower payer stocks but then they've got to change make the, sure they've, they've, they've then got to change the entire premise of the product you see well it's still above where mm. the Satrix 40 would pay you so maybe it's the makeup of the product just needs to be slightly tweaked because you might well argue oh well you know Tiger Brands doesn't look great on a 3 or 3.2% 3 yield but if you have a look back over the last 40 years it's been one of the best dividend payers in South African history so maybe it's Worthwhile. It's been a great dividend payer also because it's unbundled half of what it used to own. It unbundled Spa and, and Astral and uh, Adcock Ingram and all of yeah. those sorts of things. So it's, it's, it's generated the cash and it's done the unbundlings through those sorts of activities as well. So therefore, can you judge that history? Um, I think yes and no because they, um, they bought Adcock and then they unbundled Adcock. Mm. Um, and they might have owned it before when it was Tiger Oats. I'm not quite sure. My history doesn't go that far back. You're old. You probably know that history. So Microsoft has bought Nokia's handset division there, Norman Smith. Um, is this an, a desperate attempt to get Stephen Elop in as chief executive? Uh, I don't know. I don't know about that. But I think it is, it is quite a desperate attempt to, to shore up and, and try and grow their, their flagging mobile mobile handset ecosystem, um, which they've only got around a 3% market share. So look, cards on the table, we're, we're investors in Microsoft. Um, it's, it's very attractively priced. This is a $7 billion deal in a $250 billion mm. market cap company, of which 25% of, which of that is net cash anyway. So yeah. quite frankly, it's a drop in the ocean. The market didn't like it, and the concern is, not so much the seven billion that they're paying, but how much more money are they going to throw at manufacturing hardware and devices, which quite frankly is quite a rubbish business, Apple aside, compared to software where I develop one piece of software and it costs me nothing to sell to you, to Absolutely, you, to you. Yeah. So the business of software is fantastic if you've got a, a great barrier to entry like Microsoft does because it's got a, obviously a highly entrenched user yeah. base. Apple has managed to charge large margins for their products, and we've even seen their stock price coming under pressure because people are saying, is this sustainable? If you look at Samsung, the margins on their handset division, I think, are around 18%. Uh, Apple's overall margins are around 44 and, and declining. So you know, competitive economics will tell you that Apple's margins are going to come down. So I don't know if you really want to be in the hardware business. I think Microsoft's mm -hmm. argument is more this is going to drive our ecosystem. So it's almost like a lost leader to try and get our software, which oh, is where we make our yeah, money out there. I'm not desperate. sold. They've made a lot of bad decisions. We own it because we think it's cheap. And 75% of Microsoft's income comes from Office and their server and tools division. Only 25% is the PC-related Windows. So and on a 10 times free cash flow, we just think it's too cheap. I don't know if it's going to be the greatest deal, but it's not a huge amount. A friend of mine said this is like two dinosaurs getting together and mating. Yeah, I heard the joke, um, Microsoft at the HQ, they're busy preparing the statement to say Microsoft takes a, a write down on, and the joke went on. Yes. But there was also a Slate article yesterday yeah. on is Windows dead? Because all the devices being rolled out now, 80% of them are Android devices. Yeah. So uh, next point is quite clear that Microsoft have subtly changed their business over the last seven or eight years as the PC market got tougher and tougher. I don't think there's anyone out there that could have told you that the tablet market would do what it has no. done. Nobody. Because when Apple released the iPad, everyone shook their head and said, who'd need one of well, these? Well, Microsoft did it 10, 12 years exactly. ago. Jobs, yeah. uh, I mean, Gates was talking about it. And, and uh, unfortunately, typical Microsoft, they had a good idea, <laughs> but they didn't execute on no it pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. You don't even like Microsoft, but because it's cheap, you own it. Well, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful <laughs> business. It's a business-to-business yeah. business, business. It's not a consumer mm -hmm. business. And if they waste too much of that money on the, on the retail side trying to compete with the apples of the world, then, then yeah, it's not it a good thing. But the, the office brand and the office business is phenomenal and it generates significant amounts of cash. And just because you know, they, they sell the licenses on a per user basis, vast majority to businesses. So quite frankly, whether someone uses a tablet or a PC, they're still going to make revenue. All right. Let's have a look then at another. You're a jogger. You like um, joggers. Joggers hate being called joggers. Um, jo you're a runner. An athlete. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're an athlete. You're a man in Very his physical prime. Um, Hold Sport, therefore, is a place where you hang out a lot mm. at Sportsman's Warehouse. Coronation's been hanging out there a lot recently. Mm. Taking their stake in that business up to 25%. That's a big chunk of, uh, of, the, sports, uh, of the sports market. I think they did earn some beforehand, um, which I think they might have acquired from Ethos. Um, but but they did that, own yeah. like quite a large portion, I think 16 or 17 percent, and they've upped their stake. Liquidity is a bit of a problem. We do own some at the fringes 
on the whole basis that um, you know middle class discretionary spend or upper middle class discretionary spend because let's be fair you know no one goes out and buys a four five hundred rand t-shirt to run unless you've got serious money to burn um, and those typically are the people you see in the sportsman's warehouse remember massmart tried to have a go for them in 2006 yes. was turned down because of comp competition authorities so that's why they went the private equity route um, you know, the chief executive owns, I think, around 12.5%. Okay, so Total board else. owns 21%. Mm. So 25 plus 21 with a relatively small company. We do own a few at the fringes. The problem is, is no one can take them out. Yeah. Um, that is a bit of a problem because the competition's authority, having said no once, why would they so the, va the valuation of this thing is driven purely by its earnings. And remember, this got taken yeah. off the exchange at a yeah. bargain price and then relisted. So you've got to say, well, you know, it's, it's the same as, um, as Ivan Glasenberg. You've got to say, these are pretty astute people. They seem to know broadly when to time the cycle. So this is listed and already done well. So I know the valuation on, on some fundamental basis doesn't look ridiculously expensive. But again, this is on the back of an environment that's been phenomenal for these businesses. Are those earnings sustainable? So yeah. But you do not, you, your, your kid's still young. Wait till they have to start buying all the sporting equipment. Tennis, yeah. A kid's tennis racket, like 350 bucks. And then give you about one every tennis. year. Oh, come on, Bruce. Imagine. You've got to be there and go there every weekend. With I do. Them. Maybe that's why he doesn't like it. Yeah, they're, great, they're great shops. And you yeah. can, I mean, the amount of stuff you can buy oh. in there, I'm very nervous. I'm, I'm keen to buy a cricket bat. I haven't hit a ball in anger in 20 years. But yeah. you just want to hold do what? it. You could hit a ball. Uh, well, occasionally, if it was thrown softly enough. Inside edges. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite shot. Yeah. <laughs> He's so mean. Oh, let's have a look at a couple of the other results that came out this week. African Rainbow Minerals, Wilson Bailey Homes, and Grinrod came out with results this week. We also had a trading update from First Rand, which tells us it's going to grow its profits by another 20%. Steady as she goes. It's the best run banking business in the country and continues to perform. Who wants to have a go at First Rand before we take a break? Uh, great, yeah, great business. And, and the Michael Yodan halo continues. Um, you know, very, very briefly though, from a you know from a valuation perspective, I think that's that's priced in. So you can get a better value in a banking sector that doesn't look particularly expensive. And mm. um, there's obviously are a number of concerns in the unsecured space, but but broadly speaking, they they're good businesses, and yeah, they're not you know on a historical basis what, not particularly. What premium does it command to its peers? It's roughly 15, 20 percent. Uh, yeah, peers, it's tiny, it's but I mean, yeah, the the well, the, 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 the it's not insignificant. The, but you look at those ba banking multiples over the last 10 years mm. and apps is always cheap Standard Bank was always the most well, expensive. They all used to be on single digit multiples. Yeah. But, well, they but, but that's 12, the point. So Standard Bank regions. was always expensive. Yeah. So you wanted to avoid it, just like FNB is expensive now. So should you be avoiding it? So, so now is the time to be buying someone like Standard Bank. You know, the business has had some troubles and that's, and that's knocked down the valuation. It's still a great business with, with some nice, exciting African exposure. October 2007. I know you've got to go to a break. October 2007 is when the Chinese paid roughly 120 rand yep. a share. 130, wasn't it? 131? Well, no, it was a combined deal. Okay. You roughly came out at the share price has The share price has never been back. Briefly. Mm. Very briefly. Absolutely. But they take a long-term view. Yes. And are terribly patient. Well, certainly the management team at Standard Bank hopes so. We'll take a break in just a moment. All after the break, we'll find out whether or not chief executives are worth more than sports people and find out with Bale versus Stephen Elop, who was paid more for this week in real terms. We'll talk about that in just a moment.